Hello everyone and welcome to episode 24 of SSTO Space Program. Today we are revisiting Jewel colony ship that finally arrived at Jewel and after receiving a gravity assist from Tyler was placed in a highly eccentric orbit around Jewel. As you may remember our ship is carrying quite a lot of satellites and probes that we'll use to do some initial exploration of all of Jewel's moons and we are also carrying a small outpost and a mining station that we'll place on the surface of Pole. Our ship also carries a very special satellite that was designed to study Joule itself and um, as you will see in a second it was inspired by Juno probe sent recently by NASA, well, well not quite recently, but since we wanted this satellite to orbit Joule itself in a um, highly eccentric polar orbit it was deployed at the apoapsis of our equatorial orbit of Joule and then performed a burn that would place the um, that would change the orbital inclination to 90 degrees because as you know changing your orbital inclination is best done at lowest orbital velocity which tends to happen around the apoapsis of your orbit especially if it's eccentric. Once this maneuver was completed I lowered the periapsis of our orbit to be just above the Joule's atmosphere because well um, we want to get some information from the space close uh, around Joule and uh, maybe later we'll try to sniff a little bit the Julian atmosphere, although this is something I'm quite <laughs> actually quite afraid to do because, well, in case P atmospheres of planets do not extend very far and, um, well, we, we might not survive such maneuver. But in any case, uh, initial couple of orbits will be devoted and dedicated to getting uh, science data from space low and high uh, around Joule. And uh, we have on board of this probe uh, actually the entire science package save for um, Science Junior and uh, we'll try to get as much information as possible about Joule and using scansat antennas we'll also try to answer the question whether Joule actually has any surface under this fake atmosphere but this is something that we'll try to answer in the future right now we need to perform another very important maneuver using our Joule colony ship and um, we needed to place it in a less eccentric orbit around Joule that would be a little bit more suitable to get to all of its moons and um, for that we needed to get another gravity assist from Tylo once we got our Tylo encounter right, I deployed all of our science satellites because, well, um, we needed to tweak their orbits and their paths to actually have them end up around all of Jules' moons and um, that was a very good spot to, to do that. Uh, so, after changing their names to, you know, <laughs> to, to, to the respective moons that uh, they will be heading to and um, deploying all the solar panels and, uh, you know, some antennas. Uh, actually, so far away from the sun, we couldn't deploy all of the scanners and uh, antennas that we had because, well, the power supply was not sufficient. But nevertheless, we had uh, five science satellites. So every single one of them was exactly the same as the others around our um, jewel cotton ship. That was uh, quite a nice view, actually, with a um, lot of scansat birdies flying around jewel colony ship. And then, as I mentioned, uh, all the names were changed to their uh, respective moons and uh, we had one heading to Val, another heading to Tylo, another heading to Leif and Bob and Paul. Actually, now I came to think about that, uh, the Paul um, scanner should uh, not have been deployed right now because, well, it was heading to the same destination as, um, as our dual colony ship, so that was, uh, that was kind of a mistake on my part. But, uh, well, <laughs> what can I say? Everyone makes mistakes and it was done. In any case, all of those satellites had enough Delta V to get uh, to their destinations and perform all the needed maneuvers. Uh, every satellite had uh, a bit over 2000 meters per second of Delta V, save for the uh, Juno Junior probe, <laughs> as I called it. That, uh, that one had a little bit more and um, it was actually a bigger and heavier. So as I said, we needed to tweak the orbits of all our vessels and uh, spacecrafts and uh, our dual colony ship as well to actually get a um, Tylo encounter and the Tylo flyby that would place us in an orbit that we wanted to be and that orbit was different for every single probe. So um, all of that had to be performed almost at the same time. So that was the moment where actually a Kerbal alarm clock was shining. Actually, I um, I don't really think that I would be able to pull it off in a uh, reasonable amount of time without this mod because obviously you could do it uh, one probe at a time or I don't know note somehow where the probes are and uh, kind of do it manually but um, this mod really helped me do this properly and um, easily and much faster. So the basic idea was that um, 
we would be getting a Tylo gravity assist that would place us in an eccentric orbit between Tylo's orbit and the destination body. That would be depending on the probe or on the spacecraft, so either Tylo, Val, um, Leif or um, Paul or Bob. And then when we are um, at the apoapsis of that orbit, then uh, we would perform another burn that would actually get us an encounter with our destination body. And in the case of all of our <laughs> all of our satellites, uh, the next step was to place uh, that probe in a highly eccentric orbit around given moon, um, flip the orbit to polar orbit at the apoapsis as usual because it's easier, and then uh, lower the apoapsis and raise the periapsis to get proper altitude for um, for the scanners. That was between 400 and 600 kilometers above the surface. The reason why I chose those altitudes is that I wanted to have an, an orbit that would be viable for both high resolution altimetry scanner and biome scanners and uh, those operate at different altitudes and uh, their optimal values are um, either 500 kilometers or uh, uh, 750 so it's not possible to get one orbit for both that would be optimal so I wanted to have kind of um, you know a trade-off between the two but the bottom line is that uh, <laughs> that was a lot of maneuvers that were performed almost at the same time and it was actually quite repetitive so so I save you the <laughs> the pain of watching me do a lot of burns and you know and um, corrections and uh, yeah that uh, basically the uh, the story was almost the same all the time get tylo uh flyby some of them were relatively high and some of them were actually quite low flybys and the lowest that i that i remember was um 17 kilometers above tylo's surface so flying at more than orbital velocity that close to the surface of tylo was actually um a quite a cool experience and uh, i liked it quite a lot because you know orbital velocity of tylo is almost as high as kerbin so we were flying at uh a little bit less than three kilometers per second, uh, very close to the surface. So that was that was actually cool. I liked it. In reality, um, normally you would avoid this kind of low flyby, some um, mainly because in reality, so close to a planetary body or a moon, you would not be able to treat that object as a point mass anymore, and differences in the gravitational field would influence your orbit much more than they would normally in a higher orbit, and that could be a potential problem. But here in KSP. We don't care so much about that because, well, in KSP, this problem simply does not exist. After those maneuvers were completed, it was time to focus again on our junior probe and um, kind of change its orbit to resemble a little bit more the scientific orbits of a uh, real Juno spacecraft. So we um, decided to lower its apoapsis a little bit more so the orbit would have a little bit less periodicity. And guess what? We had the first scientific discovery and we were able to confirm that Joule indeed has no surface to speak of. And uh, yeah, that was a great breakthrough, although yielded us zero science. <laughs> but that didn't stop us from getting all the other readings from Joule and uh, around Joule and transferring that data to Joule colony ship for processing. This way we'll get more science that will be instantly converted into funds and um, increase our financial capabilities even more. Once it was done, it was time to turn our attention again to Joule Colony Ship that was entering Paul's orbit and after executing a um, relatively large insertion burn and that was due to the fact that uh, I kind of chose some um, less than optimal transfers to, to get there because I wanted to save a little bit of time. That was actually not needed and a kind of a waste of fuel. And then the ship was placed in a low circular orbit around Paul. When this was completed, we could unfreeze our kerbals that uh, were uh, frozen for the duration of the entire trip to save supplies. And as you can see, that was also achieved without any problems. And here we are, our ship is sitting in orbit around Paul, ready to commence some basic colonization operations. At this point, still, we couldn't do anything yet, because we needed to wait for the scanner to arrive, because we needed to have some information about resource distribution on the surface of Paul, because otherwise picking a right landing spot for uh, both our supply space and mining rover would be extremely difficult. But once the scanner was in place, we needed to find two landing spots that needed to meet certain requirements. They both needed to be relatively close to equator, because our orbit was almost equatorial, and um, one needed to be very abundant in ore and the other would have to be abundant in either minerals or gypsum and preferably both. And uh, also those spots would have to be relatively close to each other because once we landed on the surface of Paul we would like to refuel and resupply our spacecraft at the same time. Well, 
after a little bit of searching, I was able to find spots, two spots that would actually meet all of those requirements. And uh, we were able to find a spot that would have the highest concentration of ore um, that we could find on the surface of Paul. And uh, just a couple of kilometers away from it, remember Paul is really small, <laughs> we had a uh, we had a spot where uh, both the minerals and gypsum was relatively abundant. And then we detached our mining rover that was equipped with one vector engine that still had enough delta V to land on its own on the pole. And, uh, you know, tried to land in the spot that was picked for it. <laughs> the only problem was that I kind of didn't put any uh, control point that was aligned with the, <laughs> with the engine and uh, had to eyeball the landing. That uh, wasn't very easy and uh, actually it was going well initially but then uh, kind of when the velocity dropped and uh, I couldn't see the orbit very well on the map I was struggling quite a lot and uh, it was harder than expected. But yeah we did it eventually and as you can see the final approach was even executed on the Werner engines only on the RCS thrusters because they proved to be powerful enough to actually fight the uh, pole gravity effectively. And uh, we need, didn't need to use the vector engine, which uh, turned out to be an overkill for Paul. <laughs> and uh, really, I, I should fire the designer of this rover. But nevertheless, despite the difficulties, we've landed successfully on the surface of Paul. And once landed, we deployed all of the solar panels, radiators, and performed a uh, detailed scan of the surface and uh, for the biome where we landed. And I actually got uh, a very detailed information about the resources uh, that were uh, available in that uh, location, which uh, turned out to be even better than expected from what we've got from our orbital scans. And then uh, all the mining uh, operations could begin. So the drills were deployed and um, ISR was also started. This rover also features a hybrid um, solar uh, fuel cell power supply system which allows it to operate during night and day which means simply that uh, it can mine fuel all the time. It is also full stock so if you'd like to use it the link is as usual in the description. The next step in our colonization attempt was landing the supplies outpost and this was actually much easier than the rover because well this time at least uh, the uh, control point was aligned with the engines so it was easy and uh, we had a very powerful FUD engines and uh, as usual much more delta V than we actually needed to land on the surface of Paul. This outpost is fully automated. It can house one Kerbal if needed but it doesn't have to and um, it is designed to operate autonomously as the rover. So uh, we needed to land it in, in, in an area that was relatively abundant in uh, minerals and gypsum so we could manufacture fertilizer in situ and this was achieved without any problems whatsoever. We landed in a very nice location, a uh, very scenic panorama here on Paul, I must say, I like it very much. And uh, yeah, we had one small problem once we landed and after deploying all the drills and starting all the, you know, uh, processing plants, it turned out that our devices are overheating. And I must say that uh, this was quite surprising to me because all of that was tested extensively before launch. And I am pretty sure that it wasn't overheating when it was designed, which was in previous version of KSP, so 1.2.2. But in 1.3 it is overheating. And this is something that I've also noticed for our remote mining stations that we have on the surface of Duna and potentially might be a problem in the future. But hey, it's Kerbal Space Program and rescue missions and rescue operations are our daily bread and uh, this is something that we enjoy, right? Anyway, our initial attempts at colonizing Jules system are completed and we have established a uh, relatively self-sufficient outpost or at least long-term outpost and an orbital station that will serve as a base of operation for exploring other bodies than Paul. And uh, this will be all for this video, so thank you very much for watching, I hope that you've enjoyed. I would also like to thank another aperture, Joe Love and Sharax and all my patrons on Patreon. You guys are amazing and your support is very much needed and keeps me going. If you have any questions, please do write them in the comment section below, I'll do my best to answer them. And if you enjoyed this video, please consider liking it. If you are new to my channel, please consider subscribing. My name is Mark Frim and I will see you next time.